All right, everybody, this is Ross. We've got a little bit of a whirlwind video for you guys today, meaning that we're gonna cover a number of different topics in one video. We're gonna do actually some harvesting of my garlic. It's about that time of the year. Uh, we're also gonna do some maintenance on the European grapevines. They need to be trellised up along the wire system that I have. And the reason for that is really to uh, have better airflow because they're very disease prone here in this climate. And then the last thing we're gonna do is actually take this hoary hoary and do a little bit of chop and drop of the comfrey underneath my apple trees. Also to increase airflow, a little bit more sunlight penetration, and um, <clears throat> also it's just a great source of organic material that you can chop and drop four to six times a year here in my climate, which then feeds the trees. And I think my dwarf or semi-dwarf apple trees in here uh, really could use a little bit of extra nutrients. So let's start with the garlic. And uh, I'm not gonna harvest probably all of this today. Maybe I'll inspect some of this and you know make a judgment call, but this is really the time, right? End of May, beginning of June, around this area. You plant the stuff in the fall. It comes to fruition around this time. We get our scapes. We've been getting scapes now for a couple weeks. Once the scape forms and you take off the scape, uh, the bulb size will increase, hopefully just a bit. And then um, the plant actually starts to lose its lower leaves. The lower leaves start to die off and brown and uh, the plants are not really doing their life function anymore. They're sort of dying off. So what you wanna do is actually harvest the garlic, <clears throat> not when the plant is fully dead and fallen over like you would probably your onions. Um, you handle the garlic a bit differently. <coughs> Excuse me, guys. You handle the garlic a bit differently in that every leaf that is green represents a sheath um, for the garlic, a little papery husk, right? So the more paper, the better sheaths and more sheaths that we have of that husk, the better that the garlic is gonna store. In fact, I know this for sure now that this is the right method to do. Uh, because my garlic in the fridge is still looking fantastic um, and it probably will last another few months. So I don't really need to have garlic just yet, but uh, if you have garlic that's being stored for over a year, you're doing something right. And I read about this, by the way, in Ron Engelin's book, How to Grow Great Garlic. And this is really what he recommends is that you wanna have a nice balance of dead leaves uh, browning leaves here at the bottom, but also you want to have a certain amount of leaves at the top that are not browning. Um, because again, that really affects the storage quality of these plants. So I'm going to use my hori hori and kind of lift up the soil here around the base of the plants. You could pull them depending on how loose your soil is, but the soil here actually is really tough. So I'm not gonna risk that because if you pull these up sometimes you can pull the stem away from the garlic and that's just not something you want to do because you can break the stem and then that would affect actually the quality of the garlic now what you can do at this point is actually peel off some of the bottom layers here every leaf again represents a layer of peel and you can peel this off, clean this up a little bit, and then let them sit out here in the sun. And this is gonna start that curing process. Um, also, you can wash off the bulbs right now. You know, you could even um, trim the roots if you want, get these plants looking nice and neat. And this is our little bulb of garlic here, and this is gonna get a little bit bigger than what it is. Not the best size. But you know what? It's all right, it's not bad. Um, there's some in there that are gonna be much bigger. There's some of them that are gonna be smaller. So this is, I would say, maybe about the medium or even average size of the garlic this year. So not the best, but uh, you know, maybe they needed a little bit more water. Maybe I needed to start with a bigger bulb, bigger clove. Um, see, that's what we're gonna do. And that's the uh, little harvest that we did there. And now I'm gonna bring you guys over to the grapevines. And we're gonna do a little bit of maintenance, as I said, to help with disease. 
And this is really one of the very few things that I do with the grapevines. Um, we're gonna actually do one extra step this year and that we're gonna bag these grape clusters. And I've realized that if I just bag them, I'm gonna have way better disease tolerance in that we bag them with a wax paper bag. Uh, Michael McConkey and Lee Wright at, uh, well, Michael's at Edible Landscaping, his nursery there. And they recommend both of them that you bag the grapes with wax paper bags. And what that does is it actually blocks a lot of the black rot and disease from actually hitting the grape cluster. And that has been my big issue here is actually black rot. So what I like to do here, even though this particular, um, <laughs> this one's actually perfect. It's done itself, it's done it on its own where it's actually reached this top wire here. I have two wires. We wanna have the, the canes growing upright. And the reason for that is airflow, better sunlight penetration. And then we can also make a decision here at some point as to how many canes that we want. So if I wanna have about 20 clusters of fruit, I can count my clusters. And then I can limit some of the other canes because again, we're trying to prevent disease here. These, uh, these vines are pretty disease resistant to most other diseases like mildew and things. But if you had a lot of black rot, you had a lot of mildew, the leaves are gonna come off and they're gonna fall off. They're gonna get so much disease, they're gonna fall off. And then you're not gonna have the photosynthesis to go into the grape cluster. So you need to do this. If you're in a very humid place, the chances are very high that you have a lot of disease and this is just something I do every year. Now you'll see on every single vertical here that comes off of the cordons, because that's what we have here is a cordon system. You'll see that uh, there's about two clusters per vertical. So if I wanted, let's say 20 bunches off of this particular vine, um, I can either take off some clusters or I can thin out some individual uprights. And if I thin these out, what that's also gonna do is actually aid in a little bit of having less leaves and therefore better airflow, better sunlight penetration, and therefore less disease. So uh, it's also recommended that, you know, along these grape clusters, what you could do is actually take off the leaves below the cluster. And I think I'm gonna leave them on this year simply because I'm going to bag the grapes. But, you know, it's kind of about, for those of you that have never done this, it's just finding that right balance of leaves to fruit, having the right amount of uh, stems. You don't want this thing too vigorous and have too many leaves on it, too many branches on it. Uh, it's just not, necessary and it actually probably is at your detriment so that's all i'm doing today is just trellising these guys up this is just some green stretch tie you can get pretty much anywhere i don't know amazon local uh hardware stores it's great i use it for tomatoes and trellising just about anything um it's nice so that's what we're gonna do we're gonna, gonna you know really control this vine here and I'm gonna also thin some of this out. Maybe I can thin some of this out right now because there is just too many of these uprights. So I'm gonna come back in here and I'm gonna kind of think about this in a way. I'm gonna space out each individual upright, probably about you know one or two per spur. And I wanna have them spaced out so that they're filling every gap here, but I don't want it to be too dense. So. We'll come in here and uh, this one actually has no fruit on it. So this one doesn't have any fruit. We're gonna cut this one off. Why keep this? This is just contributing to the issue, right? And it should have fruit on it. You'll know, you'll see the fruit early on. Um, once the buds leaf out, they put out a couple leaves and it's always the same pattern of you know, leaves and tendrils, and then also fruit. So you'll see two tendrils, or you'll see two fruit clusters um, pretty much back to back. 
So in this particular scenario, I have a leaf, a leaf, a leaf, cluster, cluster, and then the rest of its leaves. And that's just what it does for the remainder of uh, the growing season. It just keeps growing leaves. So <clears throat> yeah, that's pretty standard. You know, a lot. I think a lot of uh, more experienced grape growers will give you those kind of tips. And then lastly, I'm gonna give you guys a view into these apple trees. And this comfrey here, because we are gonna do the chop and drop. And that'll call, call it a day here on the video. <coughs> Excuse me guys, I just have something stuck in my throat. Um, I do need to find my hori hori. Where did that go? But we're gonna do this chop and drop. As I said earlier, it's really for the, um, you know, for the airflow. But in all honesty, it's just getting too big. I mean, these plants are, you know, approaching three and a half feet now. Some of them are almost at my, the, my chest. So it just really doesn't make a whole lot of sense to keep some of this stuff here at this height. The big benefit is the bees. The bees love it. And that's a big reason to keep it. So if I, you know, really wanted to help out the bees, as an example, I would probably keep all this stuff because the bumblebees are all over this 24 seven, seven days a week. But what's nice about the Hori Hori is that you can really just come in here with the serrated part of the knife and just make a cut like you're cutting some, you know, vegetables in the house. And then you get yourself a bunch of this stuff and you can put it pretty much wherever you want but it's gonna go right underneath the apple trees here guys so this plant really is wonderful it has so many functions that uh, you really have to see it for yourself to believe it um, so that's what I'm doing is just chopping and dropping this stuff it is pretty much ridiculous because you know you you chop this stuff down and the next day, it almost seems like it's fully decomposed. It decomposes so quickly. You're just amazed. And I think that's why a lot of people in permaculture and, you know, just different fields just love this plant. I mean, look how much material this is. And it just keeps coming back. And uh, it just keeps giving. And it'll keep flowering too. It's not like the bees will hate me for doing this. Although there is so many other comfrey plants I have around the yard that there's plenty to go around at this point. Um, but it just keeps flowering too. As soon as you chop and drop it, it just comes back and then flowers again. And that's all it is guys. It's just so simple for feeding your trees in a really efficient, effective way. Um, you know, putting that stuff, this organic material where it's needed. And it also just adds a lot of beauty. My mom who, uh, you know, doesn't think every fruit tree or fruiting plant that I grow is beautiful. She does think this comfrey is very beautiful. And uh, I wholeheartedly agree. It's one of the more beautiful plants. I will say that uh, it does spread a bit more than people claim. And uh, I do have the variety uh, the Bocking Comfrey, I don't remember which number it is, but I did receive the Comfrey that doesn't spread, doesn't self-seed, I should say, but mine did. Over time, it somehow, maybe it adapted or something or changed genetically and it's now spreading everywhere. And uh, I can't really control it, so I'm very cautious about where I chop and drop it now. And it may end up being pretty much wherever it is, I just chop and drop it on that location to then support whatever it is that's growing there. Um, so if I have it underneath the pawpaw trees, I chop and drop it underneath the pawpaw trees. I'm trying not to spread it to other locations unless I really want it there to help support whatever that is that's growing in that location. So yeah, I hope you guys enjoy this one. I thought it was pretty informative and uh, Different way to do this kind of thing, huh? So, yeah, we'll see everybody soon. Check out our blog, figboss.com, and uh, see you guys for the next video. Take care.